All right, um, welcome tonight to uh, part two, uh, class one of the Deep Dive Genesis Bible Study. Um, watching online, uh, especially those of you who are watching on YouTube, later after the fact, I'm Pastor Danish House. This is in the East Alliance Church in Poughkeepsie, New York. If you've watched other Bible studies that we have recorded, you saw us in the basement Arlington Park Church. While well, our church was being rebuilt, our church is now rebuilt. And so here we are in our own church building. Um, we're trying things out. It's a little echoey in here. I'm not sure how it's going to go for the video. But Where's the volume? I think everybody who's on video needs to mute themselves. Otherwise, the pastor keeps cutting out. So mute your line and just watch them and hear them. I'm actually going to do that for you. Here. We're going to mute participants. Uh, how do I do that? Who's this down here? <laughs> Never had that before. To be able to just mute everybody all at once. Oh, I know how I did that. Did you get the full screen? One sec, Sue. Oh, okay. I used to be able to mute everybody. Let's just see if I can do that here. Oh, let me just mute everybody. All right, so right now everybody on Zoom is muted. Um, if you'd like to speak, you can unmute yourself and, uh, and then remute yourself when it's done. So tonight is October 6th, October 6, 2021. And let's pray and then we'll jump into the Bible study as a whole. Heavenly Father, thanks for bringing, being with us tonight. Thank you for this opportunity for us to study the book of Genesis, uh, the book of beginnings, the book of covenants and blessings. God, I pray that tonight you bless our study, that you would uh, send your Holy Spirit to fill each heart and to illumine the text for us. Lord, as we dig into the book of Genesis tonight, uh, start uh, dipping our toes tonight into it. God, I pray that you will bless uh, our study. Help us to see wonderful things in your law. Uh, Lord, may it be a refreshment, may it be enlightenment, may it be May we bless one another through what we see in the text. Uh, may, may our being together for this study be better than if we were doing this on our own. In Jesus' name. Uh, all right. So uh, for some of us, it's our first time in this study. So I want to go over some introductory stuff just to help you understand what the book of Genesis is. Uh, and why we're studying it, and then how we're studying it. We're going to be studying it in a unique way. And I hope that it's something that will really excite you. It certainly excites me. It's my favorite way of studying the church. The book of Genesis um, was written uh, probably, and, and my best understanding is it was written by either Moses or somebody a lot like Moses. Okay, that's, that's how I describe it. And you guys who were part of the study uh, at the beginning of the year, remember that um, Genesis was certainly written somewhere around the time that Moses probably lived, look back in history, um, and it was written by someone who had excellent access to uh, historical records, who had uh, a, a good grasp of how historical writing took place, also had a good grasp of uh, poetic forms uh, that were very uh, common in that era. Um, it was someone who was certainly very literate and someone who had a keen understanding both of how it, uh, things worked in, in Jewish society, Hebrew society, but also a keen understanding of how things worked in the cultures all around. Um, so if it wasn't Moses, it was somebody a lot like Moses. It fits everything we know about Moses and tradition tells us it was Moses. So. I'm okay with saying it was written by Moses. One of the things that, uh, that some critical scholarship will say is that uh, 
uh, is that it wasn't written by Moses, that we don't know who it was written by, that tradition is not an accurate guide um, to that by saying, okay, if it wasn't Moses, it was somebody just like Moses, it might as well have been Moses. So that's, uh, it was written by Moses or somebody like Moses. And um, if you, as you read through Genesis, one of the things that, as you, as you carefully look at, at what's taking place, it becomes clear that Genesis was written just before the people of Israel entered into the promised land. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, those five books were written preparatory to the people of Israel entering into the promised land after their enslavement in Egypt and after their release in the Exodus. They had then wandered in the desert for 40 years because of their sin, and now God was bringing them into the promised land, and they were asking the question, who are we? Where did we come from? Uh, and why have we been wandering in the wilderness all this time? And who is this God that we've been following? Um, Genesis and the other five, first five books of the Bible were written to answer those questions. Um, to answer the question, who are we? Who is this God? Why have we been, what has been, what's our history? Where did we come from? Um, certainly, uh, the Egyptians, when they were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, the people of Israel heard Egypt's answers to those questions. Egypt answered the question of who they were by telling them they were slaves, right? They were born to be slaves. They were slaves for the Egyptians. When they asked the question, who is God? The Egyptians had dozens of answers for who was God, right? And uh, the Egyptians taught about a, a plentitude of gods. And the people of Israel were surrounded by idols to these gods. Um, as they left the prom, as they left Egypt through the Exodus, they went into uh, an area of the of the world as they're wandering in the desert, where they encountered people who were uh, who were from a Babylonian background. They themselves, the Israelites, had come from a Babylonian background way back when before Abraham, uh, and. Uh, and, and they were wandering among people who had Babylonian influences. Well, the Babylonians told an entirely different story about who the Israelites were and who God was, okay? So the Egyptians told one story, the Babylonians told another story, and the Israelites had to wonder, who are we? And is this, which story is right? Or is there another story entirely? Genesis is the story that's being told to the Israelites. This is where you come from. This is who your God is. And this is why this God is interested in you as a people. Okay, and that's where the, so the book of Genesis and the first five books of the Bible are there to answer that question. The structure of the book of Genesis is, Genesis breaks very neatly into two parts. I normally give you guys a handout to take notes on. I didn't get that done this week. I apologize. Um, so it breaks neatly into two pieces. First is the primeval history, Genesis 1 through 11. It tells stories about creation. It, te it tells basically five stories in the first 11 books, five stories uh, that involve uh, sort of a, a cycle that starts with sin. Some sin happens. Then there's a speech that's given by God. Then God demonstrates his grace towards his people, and then he also brings punishment. So it's a cycle of four things, sin, speech, grace, and punishment. Um, and it, it happens in five different stories, as well as there are some genealogies that are sprinkled in there as well. So those things happen in Genesis 1 through 11. So stories you might remember from Genesis 1 through 11, we studied these at the beginning of the year, include the creation of the world, the fall of humanity, uh, it involves the story of Cain and Abel, uh, where brother kills brother. We have the story of uh, the Tower of Babel as well. Uh, there's a story of a fellow named Lamech who does some homicidal things. Um, and of course, the story of the flood, right? which was a big really deal story. So we, these, are the, these are the stories that we've studied in the first part of this course. The primeval history, Genesis 1 through 11, 
Uh, it's difficult to pin down dates for those stories. We talked a little bit in the first part of this course about how, how different scholars have dated those events. Uh, we talked about different Christian understandings of Genesis 1 through 11, how they were interpreted by different Christians throughout the centuries. And we talked about how um, uh, those 11 chapters are difficult to pin down in history. Once you get past Genesis 11, it becomes a lot easier to put dates on things because uh, kings get referenced, nations get referenced by name that we have historical records of in a few other sources. And so once you get to Genesis 12, you start to be able to pin down where in history these things are taking place. So primeval history of Genesis 1 through 11, Genesis 12 through 50 is patriarchal history, a story of patriarchs, the story of the fathers, the, the ancestors of the Israelite people. The, the first 11 chapters ended with the story of the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel story uh, lacked one of the elements that the other four stories had. It lacked the elements of God's grace. God executed punishment on the people uh, at the Tower of Babel, but we don't see God doing something gracious for his people. We don't see God doing something to redeem them. And it leaves you with the question, having gone through the other four stories, where is the grace? And the grace comes in Genesis chapter 12, right? Genesis chapter 12 starts off by unfolding the grace that follows the Tower of Babel. It unfolds it in the stories of the, the patriarchs, the fathers of Israel. Um, the, the major stories, there's two major characters that, uh, that dominate the stories from Genesis 12 through 50. The first one is a fellow named Abram, A-B-R-A-M, Abram. He's later renamed Abraham, and we'll talk about that as we go. But um, Abram is, is sort of the dominant character in the first chunk of the book, of, the, of his uh, patriarchal history. Uh, we, we then learn about Abram's son, Isaac, we have a couple of stories with Isaac and very little. And then we move on to the second major character who is named Jacob. And Jacob gets renamed as well. He gets renamed Israel, becomes his name. And so he is the founder of the nation of Israel. And uh, so Jacob with Israel becomes the second major dominating character. The interesting thing about the Jacob story is that uh, Jacob's story bookends the story of one of his sons, uh, Joseph, and uh, there's a lot of stuff about Joseph as well. So Joseph is sort of character 2B. <laughs> He's like the third most prominent character in, in the book of Genesis. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about because you're talking about the Yeah, so I remember the story you were teaching us about authenticity and stuff like that. So that's why. Yeah, good question. So if you couldn't hear that online, what Nicole was asking is Moses is one of the, the major, major founding fathers of Israel, not usually considered one of the patriarchs, but he is a, a foundational uh, figure in Israel history. If Moses wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy, who wrote the bits that are about Moses? And the truth is, most more than likely, Moses did. Moses wrote the bits about Moses. There's a little bit at the end that talks about what happens after Moses' death. And my guess is that was written by Joshua, who's his aide, to sort of bring the whole story to a conclusion. Um, but uh, it's also possible that God gave Moses a little glimpse of you know, a couple of events that happened after his death, and he wrote that himself. I think it's more likely, though, that Joshua wrote that at the very end. But Moses wrote about himself, I think, quite a bit. And um, when we, if we were reading Exodus, if we were studying Exodus through Deuteronomy, where Moses appears, we would see a lot of bits that seem very personal to Moses that nobody would know except for him. Um, so I would say he, he wrote those bits as well. Yeah. Good question. And we love questions. So questions are, we're going to do questions as, as much as we can. The last thing I want to talk to you about in terms of 
an introductory issue about the book of Genesis. And again, if you've been part of the study already, you're probably sick of this by now. But um, but there is a there is a major uh, structure in the book of Genesis that helps us to understand how the book is built, how it's constructed. When we open up our, our English Bibles, the book of Genesis is divided into 50 chapters, okay? And those 50 chapters are divided into verses. Um, those chapter numbers and those verse numbers were created centuries, centuries, centuries after it was written. It was created by people who didn't write the book. Um, it was... Uh, I think I think that in Genesis the chapter structure existed before Jesus, but um, the verse structure didn't exist until uh, the Middle Ages, right? So um, dividing the, the Bible into chapters and verses has an ancient pedigree, but not as ancient as Moses. When Moses wrote Genesis, he put in instead of chapter headings, instead of chapter numbers, he put in what we know as tolenotes. Tolda notes. And if you're, if you're writing that in your notes, it's T O L E T O L E D O T. T O L E D O T. Tolda note. It's a Hebrew word, Tolda note. Um, and it's so important to understand how Genesis works that I, I don't typically give you Hebrew. This one I'm giving you Hebrew for because you need to know this. A Tolda note. It's, it's a key feature in the writing of the book of Genesis. It's translated into English as the phrase, these are the generations of, or sometimes this is the story of, uh, something like that. These are the generations of, or this is the account of, it's something in some translations. Um, it's a difficult word to translate because, um, there's a raging debate among scholars whether it refers to, whether the Toledot refers to what has just been told or if it relates to what's about to be told. What's certain is that the Toledotes mark off major sections of the book of Genesis. So, for example, when you read Genesis chapter 1, it starts off, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was, uh, was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And it goes on and on through Genesis chapter 1. And it finally it comes to the end of chapter 1. Oh, my text here it is. It comes to the end of chapter 1 and at the beginning of chapter 2. And it says this. says this, uh, if, if you've got uh, one of our manuscripts, you don't have this in your manuscript, but I do, because it's, it's from before. But uh, it says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. In your print Bible, that'll be Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, okay? Um, and then when you scoot on a little further, you'll find um, at, in Genesis chapter 4, You'll find this, the next toll note. So it's, uh, it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And then you'll find later on, these are the generations of Noah in my, in my translation. And uh, go further, it says, these are the generations of the sons of Noah. I can't tell you, give you the chapter or the chapter numbers because I don't have it in my text here. These are the generations of Shem. Okay. Um, these Torah notes mark off sections of the book of Genesis. Now, there's a section of the book of Genesis that comes before the first Torah note. And as we discussed this uh, in, the, in the first half of the class, first section of the class, I, I believe that that means that that section is the introduction of the book of Genesis. And then the Toledot then marks off the first section. Right? Toledot introduces what's to come. And the Toledot is basically saying, here's what happens as a result of what we just read. And it, it marks it off. There's 10 Toledotes in the book of Genesis. Okay? And the way I think about it is that they're like pillars in the middle of a giant room. Okay? They hold up the book of Genesis. 
Those 10 pillars are the, the structural supports for the book of Genesis. And seeing those total notes when they come up is helpful for us to see how the author was thinking about this story. Any questions about the total notes? How are you guys doing online? You doing good? Give me a wave if you're doing well. You with me? All right, great. I, I'm, I'm rolling towards the end of our, uh, of our introductory stuff. We'll be diving into the scriptures momentarily. Uh, another thing you wanna know about Genesis is what's it about? Now we're developing as we go along, but some of the major themes of the book of Genesis include the include creation and beginnings, right? It's, it's about the creation of the world, but it's also about the creation of the people of Israel, the creation of, of a relationship with God that's more than just a, a worship relationship, but it's, it's a personal relationship with God. Uh, sin is another major theme in the book of Genesis. You're not going to find any characters in the book of Genesis that don't sin. Uh, sin is emphasized throughout the book uh, of Genesis from beginning to end. In addition, redemption is another key theme. Not just that people sin, but that God steps in and redeems his people. God is the one who intervenes so that his people can be uh, saved from the results of their sin. Um, and of course, the, what I think of as the major theme of the book of Genesis is the word covenant. Covenant. That covenant is... The, the, the key that unlocks the book of Genesis. And we're going to have the opportunity today to look at a covenant here. But um, I, at the start of the class, I gave you this. This is, this is my understanding of covenant. That, that, that the covenant of God with Israel has to do with being God's people in God's place under God's rule. The covenant has to do with being God's people in God's place under God's rulership. And um, that when you see instances of the covenant, we see all those three things taking place. Here's a quick example. We studied life in the, uh, in the Garden of Eden, okay? In the Garden of Eden, God creates humanity and he, he tells them to be fruitful and multiply and to replenish the earth. Um, and he gives them to one another. Um, Adam and Eve are God's people. He creates them. They're his. They're in God's place, the Garden of Eden, and they're under God's command. God makes a covenant with Adam and Eve. They are God's people in God's place under God's rule. Probably the simplest instance of that, but we're going to see it happen time and time again in the book of Genesis. We're going to see it at least three or four more times in the book. And covenant becomes a critical theme to understand the whole of the Old Testament. Okay, so Genesis has the first instance of those things. And the last major theme I want to talk about is the theme of blessing. Um, through God's covenant with the people, there is uh, one of the components of a covenant. Covenant is a covenant includes uh, blessings and curses. If you fulfill the covenant, if you're faithful to the covenant, you're blessed. And if you are not faithful to the covenant, you're cursed. Okay? And, and so there's, there are the consequences of keeping the covenant, the consequences of breaking the covenant, and the consequences of keeping them are, are good. And the consequences of breaking the covenant are quite bad. Okay? So there's, there's blessing and cursing that's involved here. Those are major themes of the book of Genesis. I have our big casket timeline here. Um, this section here, uh, so casket, just if you're not familiar with it, it's, a, it's a, an acronym that helps you to remember the contents of the Old Testament, okay? Uh, and it's with, five, it's with uh, six words, creation, Abraham, Sinai, kings, exile, and temple, C-A-S-K-E-D, casket, okay? The first 11 chapters of Genesis talk about this theme of creation. Okay? And, and there we see that God created the world, not living creatures. The Lord himself is God. He creates human beings in his image and his likeness. Adam and Eve have life in the Garden of Eden. 
The serpent, however, lies to Eve in the garden. Sin and death enter the world. God sends a flood to wipe out human beings. But Noah finds grace and is saved along with his family. And there's a covenant that God makes with Noah that he will not destroy humanity, uh, even though sin will continue after the flood. So the, the major themes here are, are who God is, who people are. There's this picture of a crown. You'll notice the crown shows up all the times on the timeline, highlighting the, the theme of rulership. You'll notice the trees show up at various times in the timeline, representing life. You'll find a serpent at various points in the timeline, representing evil. You'll find a casket, representing sin and death. You'll find the, the, uh, the Noah's Ark, representing grace, and a, and a, and a rainbow, representing uh, the covenant. So these are themes that extend throughout the Old Testament. They all get their start here in, in the book of Genesis. So creation is the book of Genesis, first chapters 1 through 11. Abraham, the second section, covers Genesis 12 through 50, the whole rest of the book of Genesis. And that's what we're going to focus on in our time starting tonight and, and moving forward. So that's this is all cheesy stuff. So if you read that, you'll know everything. Uh, we'll be talking about that. All right. Uh, any questions about sort of major themes in the book of Genesis? Including anybody online. If you have a question, you can unmute and ask your question. I see David Karen there. Hi, David Karen. Pastor. Yes. Uh, it's not so much a question, just um, the further you are from whatever is filming you, the harder it is to hear you and understand you. I, yeah, when, I get that. when you came up to mute everyone, you were crystal clear. But when you go back to the map, it's, it, 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 I can't really tell most of what you're saying. I, I imagine it's the same for the online people. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Is, is it, when I'm standing at the lectern, is it clear enough? It's not great. Okay, that's good to know. I, that's important information. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move up a little bit. And that's as far as I think I can go without losing you guys. Um, I so appreciate it. Thoughts, I'm going to see what I can do to bring the camera closer. Uh, but that, that, that would help. Uh, right. uh, What's that? For right now, this is the best that I can do. Great. Thank you. Well, all right, the last bit of introduction I want to do is an introduction to our method of Bible study. And uh, if, you're, if you're new to this class, you may not have ever encountered manuscript Bible study, but we use a, uh, a, a version of the Bible formatted in a very special way, okay? This is just the text of the Bible. Okay. It's nothing fancy. I haven't edited it. Nothing's been changed. Okay, But this is the text of uh, Genesis 12 through 24. Those of you who are online, uh, I will be emailing you copies of this. You don't need it for tonight, but you will after tonight. Okay, So this manuscript, uh, those of you who are, I don't think there's anybody new online. I think everybody online has been part of this study before. So I'm going to ask for our new folks, when you take a look at this manuscript, what do you notice about it? What's different about this manuscript? I don't know why yours has music in it. Let's take that out. Is that, that's something that got inserted there. That's from Rachel. Um, <laughs> do you have music notes in here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. What what do you what do you notice about the manuscript that I've given? Double space. It's double space. Bing bing bing, right? Very important. Why do you think it's double space? You can make notes in it, right? Uh, it's also on eight and a half by eleven paper, so you don't have to fear making notes in it as well, right? This is it's all about making notes in this. That's what it's all for. What else do you notice? The print bigger. Big print. I, I brought my Bible and it's probably five times the size. This is 
font. It's big, you can print, double spaced. It's for all of us. What else do you notice about the manuscript? No, uh, no chapter numbers, no verse numbers. Right. So there's no chapter numbers and there's no verse numbers. The, the only numbers on the page apparently are line numbers for each page. Excellent. So yeah, each page has, is, is set up with line numbers. So we can, we can talk about the text by giving a page number and a line number. Okay, and that's how we're going to talk about the text. Um, the reason that we do this, okay, is so that you have the opportunity to look at the text with fresh eyes, okay? Breaking this, the, the, the text up into verses and chapters is a form of interpretation. It's, it's interpreting, where's the beginning of this story? Where's the end of this story? What are the units in this story? The manuscript takes that away. So we, we aren't looking at this through somebody else's interpretation. We're looking at the text as best as we can, as if it were originally written. In fact, if you look at copies of the book of Genesis written in Hebrew, there are no verse or, or, or chapter markings, and there's not even any punctuation. <laughs> I give you punctuation. So that's how good I am to you. Um, so I'm being kind. I, I, I put spaces in between the words, and I put punctuation in there. In, in Hebrew, there's no space between words, and I have no punctuation. Uh, at least in the early days of Hebrew. So, uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we're leg up on that. But, um, but it's as close as possible to the original manuscript, okay? The idea here is that uh, you're going to use whatever tools work for you to study this manuscript. I'll show you what my manuscript looks like um, on a typical page, okay? So here's page 12 of my manuscript. Okay. I, when I was studying page 12, I had a box of markers next to me, and I circled things, and I connected them with lines, and I underlined things in different colors. Uh, sometimes I like to use crayons. I might use highlight highlighters, different colored highlighters. You can do this just with your own pen um, if you're really boring. <laughs> you can do it with your own pen. Just make the, the, the idea is what you do with the manuscript is you're looking at it with fresh eyes and you're trying to note for yourself what are the things that you're seeing in it. What are the things that you're seeing in it? I find that connecting things with lines helps me to see more clearly where there's repetitions in the text. Um, repetition, as it turns out, is a major tool that Moses used to get his point across. All Bible writers use repetition to get their point across. Repetition is a way that any writer uses to help you remember the thing that they're saying and to understand it more clearly. I just said the same thing three times in three different ways because I want you to get that repetition is important. And as you start to see repetitions in the text, you'll start to understand, hmm, this is the thing that is being emphasized. Uh, and that's how the, the author is getting their point across. Um, some of the things that you'll notice, you'll notice repetitions. You'll notice comparisons and contrasts. This thing is like this, that thing is like that, or comparing two things in the text. You'll see cause and effect. One of the best ways you'll see cause and effect is, now God said, let there be light, and there was light, right? Cause and effect. Uh, God's not the only one who's a cause in Scripture, but God causes lots of things to happen in Scripture. So God said, and it was so. Um, that's a, a major uh, way that things happen, cause and effect. You'll notice lots of other things. You'll see sequential numbering. You'll see a lot of numbers. You'll see things like place names and people names that you want to keep track of. Um, however it makes sense to you, you mark your text up in a way that, that is clear for you. 
Um, what else do I want to say about manuscript study? Yeah, okay. Manuscript study progresses in three stages, okay? And the, the three stages, I call them look, listen, and live, okay? Look, listen, and live. The bulk of our time will be spent looking at what the text says. Um, the first part of looking is you read through the text and you, and you think, okay, what's the end of this unit in the text? Where does this story end? Where does this section of scripture end? So when I, when I turn you loose um, from this class tonight, you're going to go home and your assignment is going to be to read through the first part of your manuscript and figure out when you should stop. You are going to figure out when you should stop. And you're going to mark where you think we should stop. Um, and what you'll find is that we'll have in the class, we'll have two or three different ideas about where we should stop. And we'll talk about why is that a good place to stop? Which is the best place to stop? And we'll make a decision about where we would put basically the end of our chapters. Um, sometimes you'll find it'll be the same place that the translators of your Bible put the chapter ending. Sometimes you'll find that it isn't. Uh, so we look at what's written, we, we divide it into passages by thought unit. We ask the questions that a good journalist would ask. Who, where, who, what, where, when, why, and how, right? Who, what, where, why, when, and how. Six, six questions. Who, what, where, when, why, how. Who, what, where, when, why, how. The journalist is the question. And like I said, repetition, we, we notice cause and effect, comparison and contrast. The, the point here is that we need to see what it says before we can ask the question, what does it mean? Right? Uh, the truth is, for most of us, we've heard sermons, we've been in Bible studies of these texts, we've heard lots of people's ideas about what this text means. And that's rattling around in our heads. And uh, we're, we've been listening to other people's ideas of what the text means. This, our, this is our opportunity to ask the question, well, well what does the text actually say? Sometimes we, we have such a solid idea of what it means that we don't even see what it says. And what it says is important. I always use this analogy, and I think it's a good one. Um, I, when I moved to the Rochester, New York area, um, we lived on a, a very busy highway. Um, our, our, the driveway of our house led on to the driveway of the church, and the driveway of the church led on to a very busy highway. Um, my kids could ride their bikes in the church parking lot, but if they went down to the end of the road, there were lots and lots and lots of cars passing by. So typically, when I left the house in my car, right, to go down to the end of the church driveway, to the left, to the right, and I would zip to the supermarket, or I would zip to uh, CVS or wherever I was going. And it was a busy highway, the speed limit was 45 miles an hour. Um, I thought I knew the road pretty well after seven or eight years there. Um, but one day, I decided to walk to the supermarket. And when I walked to the supermarket, I discovered all sorts of things I'd never seen before. I was walking along the road and I noticed that my neighbor uh, across the street in about four doors down had a tire swing on their tree in their side yard. I'd lived there for years, never knew they had a tire swing. Uh, there, was a, there was some um, little tykes playground equipment next to it. I didn't know my neighbors had kids. These neighbors, they weren't quite next to my neighbors, but they were four or five doors down. I didn't know those people had kids. But as soon as I saw the little tykes playground equipment, I was like, oh, they have kids or grandkids, right? Uh, as I walked along, I went over a, a, a culvert, a, a, a basically a tiny bridge where a, a, a stream trickled through one of those metal pipes, right? Um, 
I didn't know the stream was there. I'd driven over it 80 million times, it felt like. I didn't know there was a stream there at all because the trees were overgrown and I didn't even see the, the edges, the, uh, the edge of uh, the guardrail there. But there was guardrails everywhere in the fast road. Um, I didn't know there was a stream there. I saw things I'd never seen before, even though I'd lived there for so long because I was always driving very fast by it. Uh, manuscript study, taking time to look at what's there is a way to slow down. Slow down and look at what's really there. You're going to notice things in the text that you've never seen before. You will be shocked by the things that you see. You'll be shocked even more by the things that other people see. And as we share our observations together, you'll see that being in a group doing this you benefit from the eyes of other people. It's really cool. We take time to look at what's written and we don't move on from there until we've looked thoroughly. Then we listen to what it says. And this is the question asking, what does the text mean? We've, we've seen what it says. Now we ask, what does it mean? What is this text trying to communicate to its readers? Not just the facts, uh, Adam, Eve, garden, snake. But why? Why is this important? What is the theme? What, what, what is, what's the, the meaning of the text? We ask questions to help us listen to what it says. And what we do is we take the things that we saw in the first step and we use that as the raw material to ask what does it mean? Because if the meaning isn't connected to what's really there, then the meaning is coming out of our heads and not the text. Yeah. So what versus the so what? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So well, the, the, the first one is the what is, is, is what? What's there? Right. And the second one is, is so what? So why is it there? What is it that it's trying to say? And then the third step is to live out what it says in our lives. We ask not just what does it mean, but what does it mean to me? Why does it make a difference to me? Why did God want me to read this text tonight? Um, and that is a question that only you can answer. Together, we work out what it means. But by yourself, you ask the question, why does God want me to hear this now? What's so important about this for me? Look, listen, and live. That's the three steps of manuscript Bible study. All right, if you are participating online, like I said, I'm going to send you a copy of the manuscript in PDF form so you can print it out and you can use it in your own studies. If you're coming here on Sunday mornings, you can grab a copy this Sunday. I have plenty of copies you can grab. Uh, a copy for your for your own use, or you can print it off yourself. Um, tonight, though, we are going to start in on Genesis chapter 12. So if you're participating online, I would like you to get a Bible out or pull up this text on your Bible program, however it is that you read the Bible at home. I'd like you to pull this text up for now. If you are if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, maybe it's not 2021 anymore. Maybe you're watching it in another a later year. If you'd like a copy of the manuscript, you can email our church, church at newbeginningscma.org, and we'll send you a copy of the manuscript. Okay? Church at newbeginningscma.org. It's on our hard drive. We'll send you a copy. It doesn't matter what year it is. As long as this church still exists, you can get a copy of the manuscript. For those of you who are here in person, I've given you a physical copy of the manuscript. We're going to look at uh, page 19, and we're going to be looking at uh, lines 1 through 15. 1 through 15. And uh, in the text, that ends with, and Abram, and Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. Now there was a famine in the land. So the last words of what we're studying tonight are, now there was a famine in the land. 
So again, if you're online and you're using your own Bible, if it's the English Standard Version, it will end with, now there was a famine in the land. And I can put a little mark there. Um, if you're using another translation, it'll say something similar, but not the exact. I sadly did not figure out what verse that is. Do you have that? Somebody have that and tell us what verse that is? Okay, Dave is putting up 10 fingers. Um, verse 10. Verse 10. Okay, so verses 1 through 10 of chapter 12. Great. Now, I need my glasses to see Dave's fingers. They're nice fingers, Dave. Nice fingers. Yeah. All right. Are you, how are you feeling, Dave? Are you feeling better? All right, good. Good. All right, so we're going to do a little manuscript Bible study now. Okay, it's just a little introduction. Um, this is not the stopping point that you will find when you do your homework between now and, and next week. Okay, I've stopped it early. We're only doing a little chunk. There's, there's more of this that you're going to want to keep in your, in your uh, study for next week. But for now, I'd like you just to take some time and read verses 1 through 10, read lines 1 through 16. Um, and uh, actually, I wanted to end it at the name of the Lord. So let's make it verse 9. Verse 9, yeah. You know, I made this mark with me. Okay. <laughs> you can do verse 10 as well if you want. You didn't bring your mark. I didn't bring my mark. I don't I don't I don't work. I have to like to look through my office and find my office. Yeah, and when I moved from Arlington over here to somewhere Pastor. Yes, sir. I just got my Bible pulled up. I, I missed our starting place. It's in Genesis twelve. Genesis twelve verses one through nine. Okay, thank you. Okay, I want you to take, I'm going to give you 12 minutes to read over this on your own in silence, okay, and make whatever marks you want on your paper. I want you to observe what do you see in the text. If you're online, you may not want to mark your own Bible up, although you may, um, and uh, you make your notes maybe on a piece of paper or in your Bible itself. Uh, so 12 minutes until 8 o'clock. Okay. Up until 8 o'clock on the dot, I want you to do some observation. What do you see? And I'm going to shut up now. I'm going to go and do my own over here.
Still got a couple of minutes. All right, there's much more to see. That's my guarantee to you, okay? Um, the, the common, most common thing to happen when you're starting out in manuscript study is that you, you work for five minutes and you're like, I've seen it all. And if you push on, you see more. And if you push on, you see more. Um, there's plenty to see even in this small little snippet of text. So I wanna ask you, what can you see when you look at the text? Give me, give me something, an observation. I'm not asking you for something that you interpret, but something that you observe. Somebody online was saying something. Pastor? Janet? Um, I noticed that in the first part, there was a lot of I will. Like I will show, I will make, I will bless. Excellent. Who's, who says I will? Tons of times in this in this section. Who is God? The Lord. Yeah, right. God. God is making promises here. Okay. I will do this. I will do that. Uh, let's just quickly go through some of the things. What are some of the things that God says I will do? Bless you. I will show you is the first thing, right? Line two. I will show you. I will make. I will bless you, you said earlier. I will make your name great. What else? I will curse those who curse you. I will curse those who curse you. He says, I will bless those who bless you. I will make you a great nation. I will make you a great nation. Right. Yeah. Later on, down farther in the text, uh, if we look at line 11, it says, to your offspring, I will give this land. Right? So there's a lot of, God makes a ton of promises here. I will do this. We're not going to ask any more about it. We're just going to observe it. That's there. Good observation, Janet. Thank you for that. Okay. So going along with that, uh, um, God in the first person is, is, is mentioned 12 times in these, these uh, nine verses. It's either God, uh, God saying I or um, uh, being mentioned as the Lord 12 times in nine verses. In nine verses, there's 12 mentions of the Lord, either by his name Lord, or, or in first person singular, or I, or he's speaking and referring to himself. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that we noticed a lot in chapters 1 through 11 is that there are multiple names for God in the book of Genesis. Sometimes God is called God, capital G O D. Okay. Underlying that is the Hebrew word Elohim, which means God. It's a good translation, right? Uh, 
But the truth is that everybody called their God, God. It was the generic name, it was a generic word for God. Um, there also is the, the name, the Lord. And what you'll see in most translations is that the word Lord is all in capital letters. Whenever you see that, what you see is the word Yahweh. Yahweh used to be uh, translated Jehovah, okay? Until we learn more about Hebrew, how Hebrew works. So Yahweh, Y-A-H, W-E-H, is translated the Lord with all capital letters. And one of the things that we noticed in the first 11 chapters is that when it's talking about God as in how he relates to the world, it typically uses the word God. And when it's talking about God as to how he relates to his people, he calls himself Yahweh, the Lord. Okay, so we don't see the word God in this passage at all. Okay, we see the word the Lord a bunch of times, but we don't see the word God at all. This is not God talking to everybody, not God creating the world. This is God focusing in on his people. So very good observation. God and I are referring to God are throughout this passage, tons and tons of times. Somebody else, another observation. What else did you see? First act of faith. Okay, so that's a little interpretation. How do you look at it? What do you see? Uh, well, Abraham, uh, Abel uh, acted in faith on what the Lord told him. Uh, good, yeah, so good. So whatever you call that, in the words that we use in, in a manuscript study, there's a cause and effect that happens here. God gives a command. What's the command that God gives Abram? Go. Go. And what's the effect? So Abram went, right? So line one, God, the Lord said to Abram, go, cause. Line five, so Abram went, cause and effect. Um, and when we ask the question, what does that mean? We might come up with something like what Chris said, which is that Abram obeys God, right? There's, there's faith that happens there. There's a step of faith. So, I mean, like I'm thinking of like an normal, but like, it's like God has promised. So when you talk about God says, I want I want that I'm giving us all I will set to you or yours. So in saying, I will do this, then after I do this, this is what you're going to become. It's like when you said it in the beginning, God said that they will fly and they will strike. So I'm thinking, hey, which is me, and somebody promised me all that, which is why he stepped out and said, Well, he says, I am going to be great, or this is going to happen. So that's what I meant. It's after he said, I is, I am as you or your. Right. So there's there is um there's stuff that's God's part, mm -hmm. and there's stuff that's Abram's part. Um, in this initial speech by God, Abram's part is simply to go, right? And then God's going to do all these things for Abram. But as the story unfolds, there's a lot more that Abram winds up doing. He doesn't just go. There's a lot of other things that he winds up doing as well. And, uh, and God makes certain promises to Abram here. He doesn't demand very much from Abram. He only is demanding that he leave everything that he ever needs behind and go. At 75 years old. At 75 years old. I know that's something I was going to ask. He put, it was, I know it was made up of all he was when he departed from his own land. If that's significant, that is the one. So I think that's a. And a very interesting observation. Uh, it, it mentions how old Abram is when he leaves. Why? It's just it just sits there like this rock in the middle of the stream, right? It has nothing to do with anything. It just tells us his age. What I'm going to tell you to do is put a pin in that. Okay? Put a pin in that because it may be important later. Um, he was 75 years old. Now, one of the things that Ken pointed out is that 75 years old is pretty old to be leaving your home behind. 
right? Generally at age 75, you're settling in for the end of your journey, right? Um, but God is actually starting Abraham on his journey at age 75. Um, and, and you know, when you're 70, anything, I just, I'm 70. Um, when somebody says go, you say, what? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> go? You mean you want me to go and do more? You know, you, you can, I tend to slow down. Yeah. Um, so. mm -hmm. Very good. All right, so we're going to put a pin in the fact that Abraham is, Abram, sorry, is 75 years old. Uh, that's, that's going to be something that maybe will come up again. And when you're doing your manuscript study, you may find more about that later on. I want to ask a, a, a directed question. Who are the major characters in this section? Shechem. Canaan. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The land God showed them. Right. So he says, I'll send you to the land I will show you. And the place that he goes is Canaan. So our assumption is that Canaan is the land that God had shown him. In Canaan, they go to the Oak of Moray, which, which uh, Sue mentioned, Shechem. at the place of Shechem. So the place at Shechem, at the Oak of Moray. Then, when he's there, he has another encounter with the Lord. In the first encounter with the Lord in Haran, what is that encounter like? When he encounters God in Haran, how is it described in the text? The Lord said, right? The Lord speaks to Abram in verse 1 or line 1 of chapter 12. What is the encounter like in Shechem? Appearance. It's an appearance. God appears to Abraham. Oh, those are the leaders. They're right now. Uh, yeah. Thank God it doesn't do the talking. Say it. Thank God does not do the talking. Yes. In Shechem, but we appear. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my my error. Yeah, we haven't heard Abram say anything yet. So so far, God's the only speaker. God speaks in Haran, and then He appears and speaks in Shechem. Okay, and then where does He go? Oh, okay. So in Shechem, He builds an altar. Okay. I hope 
that you're marking that out. And he built an altar to the Lord. Then he moves to where? The hill country where? East of Bethel. East of Bethel. So he's got on his west and what's on his east. I, I or AI, I, I always grew up saying AI, but apparently the correct pronunciation is I. <laughs> I say AI, AI is my natural. So he's got Bethel and AI in it. Now, um, all, all I'm going to say is. So far in the book of Genesis, that's the first time we've seen those words. But you will not, you will see them again. Okay, these will be important words later on in Genesis and in Exodus. It's very specific. He's very specific. He's right in between these two cities, Bethel and Ai, or I. <laughs> and, what, and he builds an altar, right? He builds an altar. Is that all he does? He also calls upon the name of the Lord. Now, those of you who were part of chapter 1 through 11 may recall that in page 8, line 13, <laughs> Page 8, line 13, there's an in that we, we made a big deal about this on page 8, line 13. I'm just going to go to page 8, line 13. Those of you who are new, you can get, I'll get it for you later. But page 8, line 13, uh, it's just before the total of the there. It says, to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh, which is the end of a, of a genealogy. Okay. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And we made a couple of observations. There had been, this was the second of two genealogies on page 8. Uh, the first genealogy is not on page 8, it was earlier. But the, the one genealogy was the genealogy of Cain, the killer of his brother. Uh, and Cain's genealogy results in a lot of cool stuff. It results in uh, the smelting of, of metals. It results in the making of, of musical instruments. Um, there's lots of cool inventions that come out of the line of Cain. But then there's the genealogy of the line of Seth. And out of the line of Seth, the only innovation that we get is the worship. They begin to call on the name of the Lord. While Cain's line comes up with cool inventions and technology, Seth's line comes up with worship. They begin to worship. And that seems to be a dividing line between those two genealogies. So now we continue forward, and we're actually, Abram is in Seth's line. We see that Abram picks up the innovation that Seth's line was known for. He begins to worship God. He calls on the name of the Lord. This will not be a minor theme. This will come up again in the book of Genesis. Uh, Abram calls on the name of the Lord. We see this because it's a repetition. It's a repetition separated by 11 pages. Okay? But it's, it's still there. and We'll see more repetitions of it in the book of Genesis. All right, we, we, we made it to the end, but we haven't seen everything yet. So what else did you see? What else did you notice here in these verses? Um, action. Action, what do you mean? Um, a lot of action verbs. I counted 24. I may have missed. 24 action verbs. This is a, a passage. Oh, but I went to, well, there was a thing. Okay. So you had journey. Yeah, there's, there's a ton of action words. This is a, a passage just goes, 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 goes. The Lord says go, and Abram goes, goes, goes. Right? There's a lot of going. He goes from place to place. Okay, yeah, that's pretty important. Nicole points out that in line two, uh, there's a land that I will show you. And in fact, they come to the land 
in line nine. Um, the Canaanites were in the land in line 11. I'll give your offspring that land in 12. He goes to the land at Shechem. Oh, in line 10, right? Uh, land, 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 right? There's a lot of land in here. Land is an important word. I'm going to back up and just point out that my definition of covenant, the covenant that God makes involves being God's people in God's place under God's rule. God's people in God's place under God's rule. Land is all about God's place. Okay? So we're talking about the place that God will show you. God is going to show him a place where he will be under God's rule. He will be God's people. Um, let me ask you this. Is there anything in God's promise in this passage that relates to God's being God's people? To the sort of the growth of the, the population. Yeah, I will bless you, and, and then you know that all the families on the earth shall be blessed. All the families of the earth will be blessed. Absolutely. Yeah. I will make of you a great nation. I will make of you a great nation. Yeah, to right. Your offspring, I will give this land. To your offspring, I will give this land. Lines 11 and 12, right? There's a promise of population growth. Right? So we have God's people mentioned prominently. We have God's place mentioned prominently. Do we have any indications that God is giving a command or a rule or a, a, a law? Well, he is giving a command that Abraham, Abraham follow, it, that's for sure. Absolutely. Line one, go. At this point, the only part of God's rule that matters is the command to go. Abram, of course, obeys that command. And the result of that, of obeying that command is blessing. Okay? So we've talked about how the results of following the covenant are blessing, and the results of breaking the covenant is a curse. So we see, in fact, I, I marked every occurrence of the word bless. There's bless three times in line three. There's blessed once in line four and blessed in line five. Blessing, 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 blessing is an important part of this passage. And not just blessing for Abram, but blessing for all the families on earth. Abram obeying this command will ultimately bless everybody. That's a huge promise. I think I don't think when Abraham does this, your offspring, Abraham never gets them. I mean, considering the age and Sarah is only in chapter one, and it's not like God says, in such a time, which he could have said, you would have a son, but that never happened to those women. It does Abraham. And like he said, God commanded them, like he said, Abraham never gets them. Even when he mentioned offspring, he could not them. It was me and 75, I would have them already. Well, so at least right now, this is the setup for Abram's story. So we know some of the things that will happen to Abram later on. We know, in this room, we know that Abram had no children at this time. The fact that he had to borrow his brother's son is significant. He doesn't have a son of his own. Um, and we know that God makes a promise here of offspring. And that promise is something that Abram would have a hard time seeing in his future, right? Because he had no kids and he was 75. This is all set up for what's going to be happening later on. And it's good to notice these things. They aren't necessarily important to this passage, but they're going to be important to the passages to come. Yeah, I wonder if you're also supposed to pick up on this, which I never did before. Because we know the story. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I'm, saying. I'm thinking he's saying to your offspring, as if to say to Abram, not you. Right. You're not going to go. You're not going to get there. You're not going to get there. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, obviously, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul 
makes a big deal about that. The Apostle Paul says, Abram went knowing that he wasn't going to obtain the promise. The promise was for his offspring. And that's an important thing to Paul later on. Yeah, that's the point he said it first. This is like on the faith thing is becoming now so much more what do you call it? So the last thing I want to point out before we move on is one last observation, and it, it's sort of been hinted at already, but I want to make it explicit, is that there seems to be a progression as Abram goes, a progression in his relationship with God. It starts with God saying to Abram, so he hears God's voice. And he gets to Shechem, and God appears to him, and he builds an altar, okay? Then he moves on, and he builds an altar and calls on the name of the Lord. There seems to be this escalation that's happening, okay? There's more and more. Every place Abram goes, he seems to be building altars, which is kind of cool. And as he goes, he is... Express now he's expressing to the Lord, uh, whereas prior before that the Lord was the only one speaking. He calls on the name of the Lord. We don't hear the words that Abram says, but we have an indication that now Abram is talking back yeah. to God. And also, the first time he builds an altar, he only builds the altar after God appears. But the second time he builds an altar, there was he no doesn't there. Yes. He doesn't have to very good. Very good. All right. I want to just because we're shooting for an eight thirty end. I'm going to just uh, bring us bring this observation period to a close. Um, this week you're going to you're going to be studying more than this. You study this plus more, and we'll come back. And next week we'll start off with observations. Okay. We won't have to take time to study it because you'll have done the study on your own. And we'll share what we've seen in our study. This will all go a lot faster. We'll spend more time on observation next week than we did this week. Um, and we'll spend more time on the other core components as well. Um, now I want to ask the questions. So we, we've looked. Now we want to listen. What do you think are the important themes in the section that we have studied tonight? Uh, I want to... First off, just turn to people online because you haven't said much lately. Somebody online, what's an important theme in this section of scripture? Obey God and he will provide his blessing. That's very good. That's right out of the gate. Way to go. Awesome. Is that Jim Kaiser? <laughs> it sounds like a Jim Kaiser interpretation. Uh, yeah. Obedience to God. It brings blessing, right? Obedience to God brings blessing. And, we, and that's just a, a key thing, right? The theme of obedience to God, the theme of blessing, we put that together. We, we, we saw these were observations that we made that we now stick together into an interpretation. Obedience to God brings blessing. What else? You want to get somebody else give me a theme? Maybe somebody else online. We'll give another chance for an online person. Another theme you saw. What does this passage mean? If someone has said something online, we are on mute and I'm going to hear you. Pastor? Yes. Going along with the I will, it shows that God is in control. Very good. Thanks, Jen. That's excellent. Um, you see God in control of the outcomes, right? Uh, God is telling Abram what he's going to do for him. And 
It's a it's a certain it makes a promise that's got no equivocation in it. There's no you know ah, maybe I'll be able to pull this off. God makes a confident declaration of what He will do for Abraham. Very good. So God is God makes. I mean, I'm going to say there's a theme of promises here. God makes promises and is confident that He can keep them. Yeah. Somebody else, even someone in this room, what's a theme that you saw? I don't know if it's a theme, but what I just realized is that when it mentioned at the time Canaanite sort of in the land, oh. what I saw was that there was no fear of going into or among a strange people that like there was no fear for the So Abram is going without fear, that's good. Um, I want to tell you that you should put a pin in and the Canaanites were in the land. Of course they were. Who cares? Of course there were Canaanites in the land. Ah, put a pin in it. <laughs> But just like Abraham, Abraham being 75, the Canaanites being in the land is important. Um, I, I'll, I'll just take a step back and say that we, we talked about how the book of Genesis is written to the people who live the book of Exodus. And it's there to describe the people of Exodus, not just what has happened, but what's going to happen. And they're about to go into the land of Canaan. That's where the People of Exodus are getting ready to go. They're getting ready to go into the land of Canaan. And guess what? There's Canaanites in the land there too. So when Abram went to the land, there were Canaanites there. And there's Canaanites there still. And if it looks a little terrifying to you, you've been there before. Right? You've been there. Pastor. Yes. Pastor. Um, I would also say that no matter what our age, God has a plan for our lives. Yeah. You, you preach it, Beth. You preach it, Beth. And, and okay. something else that we didn't, my Bible in uh, verse one, before go is the word leave. He was leaving everything that was familiar to him at up, you know, at 75 years of age. And then he, and then he went to go. But leave and go. So here we have Abram, who is is you know well advanced in years. Let's just say that. And Abram um, is is he is willing to risk it all. He's willing to give it all up in order to obey the command of God. And God is not finished with Abram even at age seventy five. In fact, he's just getting started. Um, that's a great theme as well. Pastor, say it. Pastor, he's leaving at seventy-five. It says he's leaving his father. Yeah, his father must have been pretty old too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, if we look back at the genealogies, we can see that uh, Abram's father uh, had him at seventy years of age. Uh, now Abram is is seventy five, so that would put his father at probably one hundred and forty five years old. Um, we we've seen a lot of long lived people in the genealogies of Genesis, although their lifespans are getting shorter and shorter all the time. Um, but yeah, his, his dad is probably still kicking. Um, yeah, so I'm not gonna say more about that. We're going, to, we're going to close that section now. There's lots more things we could say. I want to take just a minute. I'd like you to close your eyes. And I'd like you to just open your heart up to the Lord and, and ask the Lord, why did you want me to hear this tonight? And take your pen and just write out a sentence. Why did God want you to hear this tonight? What does God want from you?
Here's my conviction. I don't believe that anything happens by accident. I don't think you're here by accident. I don't think this passage is here by accident in your life at this time. I believe that God wants to say something to you through the word every time we step into it. Uh, when I was listening to this passage uh, tonight, I was listening to the Lord, I was thinking about uh, where we are as a church, having been uh, in exile, so to speak, outside, away from our, our building, um, and now we're sort of back home. We are in the promised land. Um, and I look back on the, the, the 18 months, or almost now two years, that we've been since the fire, and uh, I think none of this was outside of God's control. None of it was outside of his, his knowledge. And God intends it as a lesson. And I, I'm going to cling to that. So for me, this is the idea that God allowed all this to happen in order to bless us and through us to bless other people. That's, that's something that I, uh, is very meaningful to me at this time. Does someone else want to share? What was God saying to you tonight? Not everybody needs to share, but if someone wants to share, what, is, what was God saying to you tonight through this passage? Whether it's someone online or, or someone here in, in person. Well, God, he's, he's trying to reach out to me or that the, the, the tool may him he will bless you and yours for you and your people. The God of Abram is the same God we worship today. And he's a God who blesses us through our obedience. Absolutely. Yeah. Praise God. One more. Somebody else. What has God been saying to you tonight specifically? I, I would like to say something. Yeah. Uh, to me, to me, the Lord just reminded me here concerning to stay with the, the thing he gives or in my life, not to run from one to another, but stay with him. Stay, stay, stay. You started something, follow through. Or here, when God speaks to him, he starts to have his entire relationship went to him, went to the Lord, went to the Lord, went to the Lord. Um, uh, going from one Bible study to another Bible study to another Bible study at the same time, that's not what God is giving to my heart to understand that. I am rejoicing because for me to remember how we studied this before, I am blessed. So thank you very much. It's funny. I think one of the things that ties in with what everybody says, and what mm -hmm. I'm sorry about it, especially for me over the last three and a half years, that my faith has gone down so many times. And then look at Abraham, he just stepped down and went back. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us tonight. Thank you for this word, which was written thousands of years ago. And yet it crackles with life even today. You speak through this passage to us, to our hearts, to make changes in our lives so that we can know you and we can follow you. Help us to obey you, Lord. Help us to trust that you are in control of the events that happen in our lives. Help us to, to obey you without fear. Help us to obey you whatever stage of life we're in. Help us to go where you tell us to go and to stay where you tell us to stay. Lord, we trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Between now and next week, I'd like you to start reading in the manuscript and figure out where to stop. Figure out where to stop. Maybe you'll come up with two or three stopping points, but find the best place you think a manageable chunk and a thought unit. When does, where does this story, this part of the story, where does it end? And we'll come back and we'll study it starting next week. All right? God bless you. Love you guys online. Thank you, Pastor. Good night, everybody.
Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Dave and Karen. Good night, Good night, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah.